Before we start this episode, the Scream Kings want to take a moment to talk about what is happening in the world around us. One of the scariest things we believe that can happen is when the line between our fictional and cinematic horror and actual real-life horror begins to blur. The events surrounding George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement this week have been weighing on us as we watch true horror unfold before our very eyes. We certainly are living in what will be a new chapter in our children's history books. We stand by the Black Lives Matter movement and all of the peaceful protests that our country is in the middle of at this moment. These protests are important, as change will not occur unless action is taken. Whether you are attending the protests, speaking out on your social media, educating yourself on the matter, learning how to understand your privilege, or donating and giving your time and resources, to the matter at hand. We stand by this impactful moment in history. Black lives do matter. We encourage our listeners to go to blacklivesmatter.com slash resources or neaedjustice.org to find out more ways on how to help and support during this crucial and important time in our lives. In conjunction with this, the Scream Kings also encourage everyone to study, prepare, and register to vote this year. Our country is at a crossroads, and with this upcoming election, it is imperative that we all remember to enact this vital right of our democracy. Please go to vote.gov to see if you're registered to vote or what you need to do to register. Our show has always and will continue to be one of acceptance, equality, and love. Thank you. And now on with our show. The Scream Kings are in no way responsible for any encounters with the paranormal, extraterrestrial abductions, eldritch insanity, hauntings, curses, hexes, demonic possessions, cryptozoological sightings, or any loss of sleep that may result from listening to this podcast. This is the Scream Kings podcast. I'm Max George. And I'm Nathaniel Darkish. I'm your number one fan. There's nothing to worry about. Your podcast's going to be just fine. I will take good care of you. I'm your number one fan. Ooh, shudder. <laughs> oh, man. Nathaniel, I just realized something. Yes. You know how we always have this awesome tagline, and I'm always like, ooh, I guess people are never going to figure out what show we're talking about, or if you can, you're a true horror nerd. Mm-hmm. 98% of the time, we put the name of the movie that we're doing in our title of the episode. <laughs> yeah. It, it's true. taken me this long. This long. <laughs> Everyone, well. we are... We are talking about a fantastic horror movie today, and truly a classic horror movie. And a book, that's right. That is, of course, the one, the only, Misery. I've talked to a few people about... Directed by... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I've talked to a few people about Misery the last few days as we've been ramping up and preparing for this episode. And I think 90% of the individuals I've talked to can't talk about misery without talking about the quote unquote that one scene (laughs) and i just the hobbling i love a horror movie that it just becomes so iconic that something so vague as that one scene everybody knows what you're talking about it's so good yeah and one thing that i really love about this movie is that like everybody's seen this right like like non horror people have seen this movie because I mean yeah it was directed by Rob Reiner it was uh, adapted by William Goldman it's a Stephen King um, but it's definitely one of his most accessible novels um, and so yeah like everyone has seen this movie it won an Oscar it it, it, it was a big deal and so yeah even non horror people have have popped in this one and and you know it, it has kind of affected uh, so many people. And 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 that's for a good reason. It's a fantastic movie. And I think in part 
of why that happened is because I think it has room to debate that it's not truly a horror movie. It's more of kind of a dramatic you know, drama piece. I mean, it's definitely horror, in my opinion. Um, and sometimes it's I think horror. the I, th I think the tag of horror movie deters a lot of people. But then when a movie wins Oscars and it kind of becomes this part of our culture in a way. I don't know something about misery. This movie was just so well executed that like you say, it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. People have seen this movie. It came out in 1990, the year we were born. It's not super old. Yeah. I think it came out the month we were born. Oh, that is true. True serendipity. In fact, <laughs> I, I remember, you know, I saw one of those things on Twitter. It's like, oh, what was the number one movie when you were the week you were born? And for me, it was Misery. And I love that. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it's not super old. The story is relevant. I mean, not relevant. It's it's still fresh. It's fun. It's engaging. You watch the movie or you even read the book. This is a Stephen King that I've actually read it is empowering because the story just sucks you in and you there's no escape. You can't watch this movie, get halfway through, and then be like, eh, I'll turn it off and finish it tomorrow. You can't. No, you yeah, you, to... you're, you, are, you are all in. So, Nathaniel, give us a qu quick um, summary, a quick synopsis. I'm sure not too many people need this, but just for some context for our show. Okay, so... The very basic uh, rundown is uh, author Paul Sheldon uh, is traveling by car in uh, the middle of nowhere in Colorado. Uh, during the winter, his car skids off the road. He crashes and then is saved uh, by a woman named Annie Wilkes, who is uh, a former nurse. And also, just conveniently, she is Paul Sheldon's number one fan. So she brings him to her house. She nurses him back to health. Really just wants him to, you know, she, she just is fawning over him. And uh, but as, as time goes on, it, it becomes more and more clear that, that she doesn't want him to leave. She wants him to stay and write books about her favorite character. He's, you know, kind of shoddy romance novels he writes uh, about this woman named Misery and she just wants to, you know, make sure that he is her pet. Uh, over the, the course of the novel, he, you know, begins to try to escape. You know, he, he's, he has a broken leg, so he's confined to bed. But, you know, he eventually starts to regain his mobility a little bit and uh, when she's away, starts tries to sneak around the house and find a way to, you know, maybe call for help uh, because, you know, she she's insisting that, you know, that she can't take him to a hospital. She can't take him out. At, at first, that's, you know, under the facade of, oh, I just need to make sure you can't, you know, that, that you're not hurt more. But then as time goes on, it's clear that she just doesn't want him to leave. Uh, and then uh, ultimately it, it comes to a head when uh, he has finished the, the book uh, that he has been writing for her. Uh, that she's been, you know, forcing him to write. And uh, then he destroys the book in front of her, and there's a there's a showdown, and it also kind of coincides where, with a, a local police officer who has been kind of looking into this disappearance arriving on the scene. So it all comes together. Annie Wilkes is defeated. You know, Paul Sheldon goes back to his life as a writer. The end. So that that's that's it in a very basic nutshell. But obviously, there's a lot more meat to the story. And and for me, at the core of it, it is a very much a, one of the iconic kidnapping shows out there or movies. And I think in the beginning, you kind of are grateful for Annie and what she's doing. She saved this acclaimed author. We could make parallels to J.K. Rowling or J.R.R. Tolkien or whoever you want to. You know, our favorite author that we love that's given us this incredible story that means so much to us. And she saved him. She nurses him back to health. And you know, at the very 
early on that there's something not right about Annie. But at the same time, it's one of those things, kind of what happens in Midsummer is it's the daylight and all of these evil horrors are going on. And I think it's kind of the same thing in Misery because Annie is a nurse. She's healing this author, Paul. And you kind of are conditioned in a way to trust nurses and to implicitly think they're doing the right thing. But then at the same time, there's this very subtle layer that starts to show at the beginning that she is not a stable human and <laughs> she's nuts and has some malicious plans in store for this poor author. What I love about this is that she, her, her particular blend of, uh, or her, her brand of being cuckoo bananas is not really the same as a lot of characters in anything else, really. Like, she, one, like, she she is doing everything, you know, because she loves him so much and she cares about him and wants him to get better. And so everything is done in the name of good, or, you know, the good for him. And so at first, yeah, you do want to trust her. You do want to, to believe in her. But it's not until she reads the book that he has just finished that is a his first non you know smutty romance novel you know it's it's the literary novel that he always wanted to write you know it's about guys and fast cars you know living in the streets and 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 she uh finds out that you know he has this book with him and and she because she's such a huge fan, you know, asked for permission to read it. He he says, fine. Like, Oh, of course you can read it. Like you saved my life. What, you know, it's the least I can do. And she goes and she reads it and she comes back and, and she's just livid. But like, but part of it is just because like, Oh, this is, has such foul language. And, you know, and, and just like the way that she talks, like, like she doesn't swear, but you know, She'll she'll say like you know has such bad cockadoody language and stuff like that, and and but like it's it's a scary scene because suddenly she's unhinged, angry, and she and she forces him to burn his book because it's it's not the kind of book that he should write, and it's it's an intense scene, and and right th from that moment on, you know that she is a dangerous person. If she, if you, if you get her in the wrong mood or just, you know, at the wrong moment and, and, and there's, you know, and, and we get reminded of that again and again and again, because yeah, sometimes she's, she's being all loving and is trying to take care of him. But then, yeah, one day she comes in, she's just, she's just having a bad day and she's just being very, a lot rougher and a lot just, you know, you can tell that things are not safe for Paul and, 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 it, and that safety is like, as soon as we, we see through the facade, you like every moment from that point onward is, is uh, a moment of peril really. Well, and I, I think you made an incredible point when you talked about Annie Wilkes being an original villain, um, be, because there's no one else in the horror genre that I can think of that is very similar to her. Um, she is an incredible personality when it comes to villains because she is so uh, almost nauseatingly sweet at times, but even Sickly that sweetness, sweet. yeah, th that sweetness though that she's portraying has this incredible undertone that she's gonna snap in any moment if I say the wrong thing. And King. You gotta hand it to him that he truly created a monster. The the closest thing I can think of would maybe be Dolores Umbridge in the Harry Potter series, where there's this one side that they portray as something very, very tender and caring and loving, and it's just surface level to a whole other level of hatred. And it it makes you wonder what her parents were like and how she was raised and why is she like this? And uh, it, yeah. it's just a, a fascinating character examination. Annie Wilkes of, because I think real people exist like this. You know, I, I'm sure we've all had teachers who, if you say one thing or do something, it triggers them and they almost 
kind of go into Jekyll and Mr. Hyde or they're just a different person all of a sudden and it's scary. Yeah. Well, and over the course of the the film, we start to actually see what her backstory is a little bit because you know, one time when she's gone, he he manages to sneak out of the room and he is investigating the house and he finds a scrapbook of all of the different uh hospitals that she's worked at. And you start to see that based on these things, she was resp- like basically she was kind of like an angel of death sort of figure. You know, we, we've seen uh, historically there's been a few examples of, of these nurses who, you know, take ill patients and they poison them to death. You know, they they over make them overdose on drugs or, you know, don't or take away their medicines or whatever it is to make sure that they die because they, they look at them and they either think that they're a bad person or that they um, would be better off being dead. And so, yeah, they, they took it upon themselves to do that. And so you see that, that this has been Annie's past, that she has been doing this kind of thing until she gets caught. And then she goes somewhere else and does it until she gets caught. And, you know, and, and, you know, there's even like news clippings of her, Almost, you know, going to to prison, you know, being on trial as as this dragon lady who's murdering children, and she has a scrapbook of this. So you see, she is a serial killer, basically. But, but you know, but she's doing it because she thinks that that is, you know, I'm sure in her mind she was saving these people. She was doing, you know, doing them a kindness by murdering them. Well, and I think that, again, is some of the true beauty behind her evilness, is that she she portrays the sense of caring so much about people to the point where it makes her do horrendous things to, the, to killing innocent babies. And, and in her mind, she's probably thinking this is the best thing for these children. It just, oh, she's such a fantastic horror villain, and I wish the horror community would give her more credit because I feel like she kind of gets forgotten about sometimes. <laughs> um, you know, we have our Annabelles and we have our Reagans and uh, Ghost Head, I can't even think of the right name from Scream. Um, Ghostface. Freddy, Ghostface. Freddy Krueger and all of these horror icons. Why aren't people dressing up like Annie Wilkes? <laughs> because it's too plain. Like, it's, it's hard because there's not this super iconic look for her is, is I think what it, what it boils down to. She's just like, you know, someone's weird aunt, like your next door neighbor. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And so, so I guess, you know, we can't really talk about her without talking about how amazing Kathy Bates was. Yeah, Um, for real, because I, I saw misery before I read the book and I don't know if that was a detriment to me, but when I was reading Annie Wilkes in the book, it was Kathy Bates. Kathy Bates has yeah. kind of created the image of who Annie Wilkes is. And holy well, cow, and just, Kathy Bates, if you ever listen to this episode. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I like I think Kathy Bates is a is an amazing actress. And yeah, there's there's just like, I don't know. There's a reason that she won her Oscar for this movie. It is so such a an incredible tour de force uh performance, you know, it's it's intense. And then at times it's sweet and at times you feel bad for her. And, and, you know, she, she really, you know, encapsulates this very sick woman who is very dangerous. Um, and one thing that I, I love, uh, just kind of a, a fun little piece of trivia is that when she won her Oscar during her Oscar speech, she uh, apologized to uh, James Cann's ankles as part of the speech. <laughs> so, so, you know, the, the infinite, uh, infamous hob- hobbling scene even got referenced by her when she was getting, you know, rewarded for her well earned or, yeah, her, her amazing performance. Well, and I think the thing that Kathy Bates did the best is that sometimes you'll see actors and actresses who are playing a part in a movie. Um, and I think we've talked about this before on the, the show, but Kathy Bates isn't playing Annie Wilkes. She almost becomes Annie Wilkes. You can kind of see it in her eyes, even, and it's just so terrifying. 
but also you can't look away at all at all because she's so dynamic and she is capturing every scene that she has she is in it's just brilliant i watched misery with some friends and one of the friends is actually a host of another podcast called tales from the table they do a kind of a dungeons and dragons show every week and kind of a kill the monster it's really cool and the host his name's wes and he has never seen misery and watching him watch kathy bates was more entertaining than watching the show just because he was so scared and unnerved and terrified the entire time and it that's the majesty of the show is it's one of those movies that is truly horrifying and i think 80 90 percent of that is due to kathy bates and her performance absolutely and and you know like it, yeah it's so grounded in reality like this is a horror movie that could happen and has happened like this kind of thing has happened to people and so that's i think part of what makes it so chilling um but also yeah so accessible to people because it's it, it isn't some supernatural you know clown monster it isn't you know some uh, vampire or zombie it's a woman who could be your next door neighbor and for all you know your next door neighbor is exactly like this james can completely change when she leaves and he's calculating and and trying to think of what to do next and it's just so brilliant and the other thing is it's all happening essentially in one room the awesome set the set design of this movie is in one room of a house basically oh it's fair well yeah so so i had the experience of reading the book first and and like i was shocked that like i read a i don't know four five hundred page book and yeah 90 percent of it was in a single room and it was amazing and fascinating and super compelling the fact that stephen king has done that not once but you know multiple times you know because he did kind of the same sort of idea with gerald's game uh is is incredible like that is such a, a skillful thing to do as a writer and it worked so well both in the book and in the movie so i love that speaking of the writer i just wanted to briefly hit on like how like it's it's no wonder that this is so good because one one of best or Stephen King's best books, and then it was adapted by William Goldman, the dude who wrote <laughs> Princess Bride. Holy cow! Like and 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 wrote the movie of Princess Bride and the book, and he's just an incredible you know prolific screenwriter. And then it was directed by Rob Reiner, who also directed the Princess Bride and Spinal Tap and Stand by Me and. So much amazing stuff, like, ah, uh, just, just so good, so good. Like, this is a dream team, and then they had the perfect actors, and ah, uh, yeah, like, there's no way this movie wasn't going to be amazing. And I think we've kind of talked a little bit again about why the story is so compelling, because it's a villain who could be your next door neighbor. And kind of this dichotomy of a profession that is a healer, and instead they're slowly killing you, basically. The movie, for me, is so compelling without elements of gore or demonic possession or the supernatural or the paranormal. It's a real life story that can happen to anybody, realistically. And they don't rely on kind of those gimmicky horror tropes that we've seen so much. They really let the horror just be horrific. They let the story be the story because that is terrifying. We don't mm -hmm. need any of that extraneous stuff. It's it the story and plot and dynamic between Paul and Annie in and of itself is scary enough to rely on itself. And yeah. that is, when you think about it, that is good storytelling, where you don't need to, you know, frost these gimmicks of jump scares and, oh, let's make it an ancient burial ground and let's bring in aliens. Like, I don't know. It felt like the story was just kind of taking a breath and saying, this is me. I'm a terrifying story. Deal with it. <laughs> yeah. And, and 
I, I think something that really worked is that it did a great job of ratcheting up the tension the entire movie. Like, without it ever, like, like occasionally, like, there would be a moment of relief or, you know, a brief moment of, of humor. You know, it would sometimes, you know, cut. The cop and his wife are relationship goals. I just need to say that. They are wonderful people. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, it it would cut to them whenever you were like needed to breathe for a second. And then as soon as you're like, OK, I feel OK again, then it would go back to Paul and Annie and suddenly it would t- turn it up even more. You know, one of the things that I think works so well is that it would dangle all of these dark possibilities in front of you. You know, it it really played with this idea uh, that you know, when he finishes this book that Annie has demanded that he write for her, that he, that, you know, it, it, it was playing with this idea that, like, she'll read it and then she'll kill both of them. You know, she'll kill him and then kill herself. Like, that was kind of a thing that it was dangling. It didn't ever have to come out and directly say, this is what's going to happen. It played with that idea. It, it put all of those cards on the table. And then it let you go, oh, he, he can't finish that book. He has to make it last longer. Um, and, and also just like, you know, there's also like some some kind of more natural tensions of like, he is a writer who's, uh, you know, because in, in his previous uh, book that hadn't come out yet, he had killed off the main character, Misery. And so when Annie finds that out, she loses her freaking mind. And it's like, you have to bring her back. You have to bring her back to life. And so then he had to figure out a way to do that, that, that she would accept. And and not only that, Nathaniel, let me interrupt. But I think this is something that the book actually does better than the movie. Because if I remember correctly, in the book, when she starts to freak out, not only is there that horror of her freaking out, but she is his lifeline. His legs are broken. He's not eating unless she's bringing him food. He's not using the restroom unless she's helping. And so when she kind of disappears after Misery dies and she finds that out, this man isn't just struggling with her as a psychotic person, but his basic needs are not getting met. He's in excruciating pain and she's breaking him. It's torturous. And it's so wildly twisted because then he he breaks like any human would and he's just he wants those medis- medications so bad he'll do and say anything to get that you know yeah yeah he has to suffer oh, for oh, days so on end until she's willing to start bringing him bring him back stuff and even then she refuses to give him medicine until he s- swears to her that that he'll write her this book and then you know, finally, as he's writing it and, and it's torture to himself because he thought that he was finally done with him writing these, you know, smutty romance novels. And now he could finally, you know, write the books that he's always wanted to write now that he's financially stable and all of that. And, and you know, and he he's hated doing it for so long and he has to write another one for this crazy person or she'll just let him starve or suffer. And so, yeah, it's it. Like that in and of itself was a really good, really intense thing. And then they kept heightening it more with the, you know, the possibilities of that, that, yeah, maybe she will, you know, do a a murder suicide at the end. And also, yeah, sometimes she just says things that are just so uncomfortable, you know, where, where, you know, she, she reads something that he's written and she's just so smitten with him. She's like, Oh, I love you. And he's like, Ugh. you know, and, and it, and it seems very romantic. Like she could just jump his bones right then. And you're like, Oh no, 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 no. And so, yeah, the, the fact that she's so hot and cold that she is so just on this like razor's edge of, you know, sanity versus just being in a depressive mood and, and just letting him suffer for a week on end. And, you know, whatever it is, it's, there, there's always something bad just around the corner, and you don't know what it's going to be next. And uh, it's so good. I think it's time we talk about the scene, the scene, the iconic scene, <laughs> the hobbling of 1990. Stop. 
Hammer time. <laughs> no, I forgot when I rewatched this a few weeks ago, I forgot you see Paul's ankle break across the brick. And that just made my heart turn. Oh, I, think pe- oh, I, think I don't people- do well. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I think people forget that that is actually in there because I think everyone looks away. Like, everyone looks away. I am positive that happens because it's so uncomfortable. This man cannot move. He's tied down to this bed. He has... His legs have finally started to get better. Yeah, and he he's kind of created this escape plan in his mind, thinking that he's outsmarted Annie Wilkes when the whole time she's known. And I think she's just kind of been waiting for that perfect moment to say, hey, I know what you've been doing. I know you've been around the house. That dumb porcelain penguin was his downfall. Um, and then the hobbling happens. And you just lose it's like you lose your faith in the end of the movie because how is he gonna overcome this woman he can't walk he can't get out he is now dependent on her physically even more so than he originally was and and you just lose the hope along with him and it's just traumatizing yeah and i love that like yeah they they did a, a practical effect for that they built legs out of like gelatin or something like that so it would really bend and flop in really viscerally upsetting way ugh ugh that scene it's what iconic for a reason the book nathaniel do you want to tell us what happens in the book instead of the movie let's let, let's do the book after we uh i'll, I'll talk about all, a bunch of stuff about the book in a little bit after we kind of maybe wrap up the movie if that sounds good to you okay Absolutely. So, um, should we talk about what we didn't like about the movie? Uh, yeah, there's just like two things. I mean, because it's pretty, <laughs> pretty stellar movie. I feel like the, our last two episodes between Ghostbusters and this, we we haven't had a lot of bad things to say, which is a little odd for you and me. <laughs> well, I literally can't think of a single thing I would change. So you go ahead. You you be wrong about this movie. <laughs> oh, <laughs> all right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, friend. Um, I, I don't know if they're bad things, because the movie is pretty perfect. Um, I feel like once Paul is able to overcome Annie, the, the wrap-up is very, very fast, which is jarring in its own sense, and I can understand why they would kind of go that direction. But I feel like we had been on this journey with this poor author through all of this misery, pun intended, I don't even know if that's a pun, but I'm going to lean with that. Um, I just Title reference intended. Wanted s- <laughs> I wanted a little bit of his redemption from when he dealt with Annie to that restaurant scene at the end of the movie. I just wanted to know who found him. What did he do? Was he able to call 911? Was the sweet wife of the dead cop the one who saved the day? I just wanted the story expanded a hair just because I felt like we as the audience deserved that because we had been on this traumatic journey with Paul. So you just wanted a little bit more denouement. Yeah. Um, And then also I, I had an observation and I wonder would this story with the story of misery, Annie Wilkes and, and everything that we've just talked about, would it hold up in modern day with cell phones and the internet and social media and kind of everything that we have access to? I've listened to enough because crime I think, podcasts to say that, yes, I think it could still happen exactly the same. I agree. I just think when I was rewatching it, I kept thinking that, you know, no one knows where Paul is. They knew where he was. But there was no, cell phones didn't exist, social media wasn't a thing, no one really outside of his immediate circle knew what was happening. And I I think that was another level of horror that was implemented, is he, in some regards, was kind of forgotten. The rest of the world, you know, just thought he moved on, and I don't know, it just was a a fun thought experiment for me to, to kind of see if it would hold up in the 21st century. Yeah, I, I think in it, 2020. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I think that there are elements of it that, like, maybe it would Annie would have had to take a few additional steps. But for the most part, like, she lives in such a remote area. She did a pretty good job of hiding the car. Um, you know, really, all you'd really have to add is just her smashing the cell phone, that kind of thing. And you'd probably be okay. Um, you know, very little besides that would have to change. Um, but, but yeah, like, I, I, I think, you know, certainly um, it would have been interesting to see, you know, a, a version of this story where, you know, then suddenly there was like a, a big social media search or something like that that ultimately failed. That kind of thing could be interesting. But ultimately, yeah, it, it's it's really a story about Paul and Annie in that room. And and it works like, I don't know, I, I, I could see it definitely being something that could happen even today. Uh, just again, you know, listen to so many true crime podcasts. And yeah, like this kind of thing does happen today. and it's. Uh, real messed up. <laughs> and I agree. I just thought it was kind of fun. And and I think if it was to ever be remade and they did add in, you know, a social media crusade or, or whatever, it would take away from what you just said, that the story isn't about looking for Paul. It's about the dynamic between him and Annie mm -hmm. and the horror that exists between those two. That's where the story and the plot is, not in the the hunt for Paul. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, should we move on anyway. to ratings? Yes, please. Okay. So as far as ratings go uh, for screams, I gave it a seven. Uh, I would say I, uh, a lot of that really came down to that hobbling scene. Go ahead. I, I gave it a seven as well. I, I think Kathy Bates was the leader of the scares and the horror of this film without her. It, would not have been scary at all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and then as far as crowns go, I'm going to give it a perfect 10 because it, again, it's such a perfect movie. And I gave it a nine just because about the ending, I wanted a little bit more, but also I'm just saving my 10 for that one movie that just blows my pants off. And this got close, but it didn't blow my pants off. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Maybe, I mean, you can be wrong Where about things. Pants? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, go to hell. <laughs> um, <laughs> All right. All right, so let's talk about the book. Uh, so, as, as has been referenced, the, the film is a very faithful adaptation. Like, so faithful. It's great. Yeah, it, I would say it is probably one of the most faithful adaptations of a book I've seen ever. Um, and part of that just works because the the book is just such a solid, uh, adaptable piece. Um, so there are a few small differences. Well, and I think, I was just going to say, I think the book, like the crossover is so good because the book is not this ginormous piece of fiction that you're trying to, you know, take out a lot of internal dialogue and storytelling. It, it's very kind of to the point in some regards which is a lot different than some of the other Stephen King books I've read. Yeah, he can wax poetic at times. And and he did... I, 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 was... Uh, I, I was just going to say Pet Cemetery. That's all I have to say about him over-explaining things. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah, Pet Cemetery was a little much at times. Verbose? Sometimes. And, so... and that's not his worst one for that by any means, even. Just look at Under the Dome if if you want one that's really full of itself. Um, but but yeah, this one was a lot more sh sharp and to the point. Um, but yeah, there are a few differences. Uh, as you referenced, one of the big ones is that hobbling scene. Um, she actually cuts off his foot with an axe in the book um, instead of just breaking the bones in his leg. And apparently, they they made the the change just because it would be easier to not have to have a lot of gore in that scene and all of that, you know, just budget wise, it was a lot easier to, to do the other, but then it ended up being the sledgehammer, honestly, I think affected people more than an ax would have. So I agree. I, I feel like the, the, I, I don't know. They, they kind of just went with the budget route, but then it ended up being much more iconic uh, and unique in this way. Um, 
Another big difference is that the book that he's writing, Misery's Return, um, in the movie, they actually have Paul destroy the book at the end of it. Um, you know, he burns it in front of her and like shoves the uh, the burning pages in her face and all that kind of stuff uh, as he as he's fighting her to you know survive at the very end. Um, in the book, he actually uh, hides it uh, and just pretends to destroy it. He just like puts like the first couple of pages up uh, on the on a stack of paper and then lights that on fire. And then, you know, does the same kind of thing. But, you know, he ends up actually publishing that book and it ends up being very successful. But he actually ends up kind of having a love-hate relationship with that book in, in the, the novel version um, because it kind of helped save him in, in a lot of ways and also just helped him stay sane in the situation. But I can see why they, they made that change. At, it's kind of harder to explain that without having a lot of internal dialogue of you know, how he feels about the the book and the series and all of that. So the, that those are really the key differences. Other than that, it was really, really close. You know, then they just added a little bit of stuff with like the cop and his wife and, you know, kind of some fun, you know, breather moments. But other than that, basically the exact same. And again, not a surprise that it's a good adaptation because William Goldman did it. Um, so, but to kind of dig into to the book, um, I would just say, yeah, for me, this is top tier King. Like Stephen King, the, this this might be in the top th- five, maybe top three Stephen King books for me. It's so good. Why is that? I mean, you're a huge Stephen King fan, and I've read a few of his things, but you've mentioned a few times in the episode that you think it's one of his best works, and why... Why is that? What makes Misery one of the King's greatest pieces of work? I'm just curious. Well, one of the things is, I think, what we referenced, that as a whole, it's just a tighter book than a lot of his other books. You know, a lot of other books, he tends to kind of wax poetic and go down it, or, you know, get out into the weeds in terms of just being really weird. You know, take It, for example. It gets very mm-hmm. weird. The the ritual of Chud is extremely bizarre. The you know, that has the the turtle from the Dark Tower series in it. it it's just it gets convoluted and kind of weird and like I love the weirdness of Stephen King, but this one you didn't need to have any other understanding. It was just a tight book. And and it really kind of showed off his chops as a writer. Like he managed to make an extremely intense book that makes you want to just like not ever put it down. And it's again, all in one room, pretty much. That's incredible. Um, I, I felt like the characters were much more personal and, or like personal and relatable than his other books. Like Paul Sheldon was, I, I would say one of his most compelling protagonists you know he, he writes a lot of books about writers because that's just you know what he does and and you'll notice that a lot of writers like to write about writers because that's uh what writers tend to spend their time thinking about but to me paul sheldon was a more interesting one than a lot of his other ones because a lot of the other ones are just kind of like basically just stephen king in in different forms this one, it just felt like it was a character that was a little bit more fleshed out, a little bit more, you know, it, it wasn't just a stand-in for King. It was, you know, he, he just had a little bit more complexity than a lot of his other characters. Um, Annie Wilkes is one of the most interesting villains he's ever written. And also just like, to me, really kind of what this boils down to of why this is such a strong book is that it... There, there were a lot of personal stakes in kind of what he was writing here. Um, Stephen King has, a, a, in a few interviews, referenced that really this book is, is very symbolic for him personally because it, it really kind of relates to uh, his uh, struggles in overcoming his uh, drug addiction. If you weren't aware, he was a, uh, on all kinds of drugs and alcohol and all sorts of things. Uh, for a period of his life and it eventually, you know, and and it was extremely bad. Like 
he doesn't remember writing the book Cujo. He likes it. Uh, he just doesn't remember any of that writing process. So it, he was just that's crazy wasted all the time, and so you know, and, and it eventually got to the point where his wife basically said, "I'm taking the kids. I'm leaving. I'm going to come back in a month. If you are, if you've cleaned yourself up, then we can continue being a family. If not, uh, we're just then I'll just be coming back to get the rest of our stuff." So. Uh, he decided to turn his life around and, and overcome that. But, you know, overcoming a, a really intense drug habit isn't easy. And so he really kind of put a lot of himself in this book. This, you know, the, the struggles of Paul really, you know, going through the the withdrawals as, as you know, when when uh, Annie's denying him the the drugs, when she's in her depressive state about uh, misery being dead in the book, um, you know things like that. That was very personal, but also like really like Annie herself kind of represents that addiction. You know, she is the the sickly sweet. You know, oh, it'll take care of you. It'll make everything feel okay, but. Sometimes the sinister things will creep through, and if you try to get away from it, it will try to destroy you. And so, like, yeah, like, Annie is his drug addiction, and so I, th- I feel like she is a, a more compelling, uh, dynamic villain because she really had that symbolic power in, in what he was writing. And like you said, I think there is some incredible metaphor there that she was so sweet and he needed her really to stay in a good frame of mind, Paul. But then she would turn on him in the the flip of a switch and and drug abuse and drug addiction, I imagine, is very similar in that regard where it is enticing and you need it and you want it. And then all of a sudden it turns around and kicks your ass. and. Once you said that, it was clear that, yeah, the descriptions of the drug withdrawal in the book felt very real and very personal, but Annie took on a whole different meaning. Once you wrote that down in the show notes, my mind was kind of like, oh, holy cow, that's, a, that's brilliant. Uh, because, it, because, again, real horror is the stuff that we deal with day by day, and what's more horrific than being addicted to something that you start to lose control over, you know? Wow. Yeah, so so it had the real-life horror for Stephen King. And also, like, you know, of course, at a surface level, it's also just that sometimes it can be scary to have people who are really obsessed with you and obsessed with what you do. Yeah. And, you know, I'm sure Stephen King has encountered that a lot. Yeah, so that, you know, it's 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 not a coincidence that Annie is his number one fan, uh, and that's kind of a, the thing that it plays with. Because, yeah, I'm sure there have been times where Stephen King has felt uncomfortable around fans. You know, I, I know generally he has a very positive relationship with his fan base, but, you know, any any person in the in the public spotlight is going to have a few instances where lines get crossed and uh annie crosses that way 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 just uh, she 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 steps across that day one and just keeps running just just a little bit uh can i just talk about a couple other things that i find really fun about the book absolutely okay so one of my favorite things is that uh the book actually shows big sections of the misery's return book as he's writing it and so as he's writing it he's writing it on this um just you know crappy old uh typewriter that starts to fall apart more and more over the course of the novel and so there's big sections where um annie actually will take the the stuff and then like write in like all of the letter r's for him because that has fallen out and so he can no longer type that and so those sections look like a, a you know typewritten manuscript copy with handwritten R's in it. 
And then as as he starts to lose other letters, it also has you know more of the handwritten letters over. It. And then there's a, a period where you know he tells her, "Oh, I don't want you reading it anymore. I, you know, I want it to be a surprise." And he's trying to be you know he's acting all sweet as he's kind of planning his his last stages to try to escape. Um, and so for those sections where she has stopped writing, uh, there is just big sections with just, you know, blank spots where there are supposed to be letters. And it's actually really difficult to read. Uh, but I loved seeing that because it, it really kind of made the book seem more real to me. It was kind of almost like a found footage type experience reading it. Well, they do something similar in the movie, even when Paul is typing on the typewriter. They mentioned that I think the letter H or R is not there. And so as he's typing, you're seeing words without those letters. Um, and of course, it's, it's not as profound as it would be in the book to actually like visually see that while you're reading it. But that detail just, again, proves the caliber of this movie. It's so good. Yeah. And the book. And the book. Yes. Uh, and then another thing I find really interesting about this one is that this was actually going to be uh, another book that uh, Stephen King published under a pseudonym that he's written a few books under, uh, Richard Bachman. Um, so if you're unfamiliar with Richard Bachman, uh, his his pseudonym, uh, he has mostly written kind of more like it, it, it was still horror, but a lot of it was more grounded in reality. And so for, for, from that angle. I could kind of see that this might be a Bachman book, but really it kind of surprised me in a lot of ways because this book is very, you know, has, has that very personal stamp of Stephen King and, and his drug addiction and all of that. And, and also just like stylistically, uh, the writing definitely felt much more Stephen King than Richard Bachman. You know, he kind of tweaked his writing style when he wrote under that name. Um, but while he was writing this book, uh, there was uh, it, some reporter figured out that Richard Bachman was Stephen King and, you know, published a big thing about it. And, you know, there's a big hullabaloo about, oh, Stephen King is Richard Bachman. And so he decided to actually publish this one under his name and actually kill off Bachman. Uh, uh, he uh, said that he died of cancer of the pseudonym. Oh, so that was fun. I just thought that was an, an interesting fact uh, for those of you who are maybe unfamiliar with some of the kind of uh, less well-known Stephen King things, such as, yeah, the Bachman books. Um, incidentally, it wasn't actually the last Bachman book that he wrote. He ended up writing one more later, but it was, you know, allegedly a, a, a manuscript that he found, you know, in some trunk that Bachman had left or something. I don't know. He He had a whole... Ah. thing about it but anyway um but that was fun so uh did you know that misery got turned into a broadway play no and i saw this in our show notes and i need to see this yeah i need to see annie wilkes sing a song that sounds like my dream i'm actually not sure if it was a musical i i want to say it was just like a straight oh play okay, the i guess i'll have to be um but yeah so but so goldman actually adapted it uh into the broadway play uh, which you know he's he's done a few plays as well uh and then the broadway cast actually had bruce willis as paul sheldon and laurie metcalf <laughs> as annie wilkes so i think that would be a really interesting and casting. When, when we talked a bit about uh how the movie was done essentially in just the one room i was thinking at how perfect would it be for kind of a stage play they wouldn't have to do a ton of set design or set work at all mm -hmm. i think seeing those visceral reactions from the actors would would be phenomenal i wonder if it ever is playing or i mean not now with covid but you and i have to might have to go to new york one day uh yeah um, <laughs> and then also, were you aware that the second season of Castle Rock features Annie Wilkes as a character? Oh, I am very certain, but you love this show. So go ahead and tell us what it is. Okay. So, uh, Castle Rock, if you're unfamiliar, is a show, uh, it's basically, you know, other writers and, you know, filmmakers basically kind of playing within the Stephen King universe, uh, 
uh, specifically playing in the town of Castle Rock, where many of his books are set. Uh, but the second season features Lizzie Kaplan uh, playing Annie Wilkes as kind of the main character of that season. Uh, and, you know, so basically it follows her as uh, this woman with uh, her daughter and, and she's kind of been moving town to town and she's doing medical work, but it, so I actually haven't finished the season, so I can't speak to everything that happens, but the episodes I watched of it, one, I just wanted to say Lizzie Kaplan knocked it out of the park as playing a young Annie Wilkes, like the, Oh, so true. Yeah, her, her mannerisms were very much channeling Kathy Bates. Like I, I, I believe I saw somewhere on like Twitter or something that Kathy Bates was like, yeah, Lizzie Kaplan killed it. Like, <laughs> so, you know, if, if you're getting a shout out from Kathy Bates herself uh, about that character, then, you know, you know, you did it right. Um, but, but yeah, so it's, so she's kind of the, the main character and, and she ends up kind of getting pulled into the, uh, some sort of, uh, I don't know. The, the conflict's kind of confusing. It's It has to do a lot with, like, basically workers, like, migrant workers unionizing and a whole thing. But basically, she, she kind of, like, happens upon some people, like, making Molotov cocktails to go burn something down and then ends up getting pulled into a lot of this conflict. But it... It's really interesting to see Annie Wilkes in a very sort of different sort of role. Like it, it kind of sets things up to be much more sympathetic for her, but like it also makes it very clear like she's very mentally unwell. Uh, she's very unstable still. And so I, I don't know. It, it was really cool to see Annie Wilkes in such a different context. So I don't know. I just thought that was a lot of fun. So, you know, definitely if you like oh. Stephen King, <laughs> worth checking out Castle Rock, specifically the second season. Or if your best friend is obsessed with Stephen King and forces you to watch a few episodes and then you become addicted and you watch all of it. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> True story. True story. I do what I can. All right, Nathaniel. Uh, anything else we want to say about Misery? Such an incredible piece of film. If you have not seen this movie... Stop what you're doing and go watch it. It's on Hulu. Uh, it's brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant. I, like I like we've said, it, it doesn't get much better than Misery. Very true. And also, the book, again, brilliant. Worth your time. Pick it up. Seriously. Like, if you love the movie, read the book. You'll it, It'll just make you appreciate the movie even more. And also, just, yeah, like, it, it's just great. Enough said. All right, shall we dive into how we're staying spooky, Nathaniel? Why, yes. How are you staying spooky, Max? Um, I have two parts. First one is I downloaded a $10 PS4 game called Medieval, except the die in the word medieval is all capitalized, so I think it's trying to say medieval. I don't know, it's very confusing. Um, it's essentially it's just about how you medieval. this very... I know, but like they're trying to make a point of the word die. Hmm. Anyway, um, and I think because the plot is a uh, long time ago, there was this kingdom who got attacked by a necromancer and there was this courageous hero who killed the necromancer. However, he came back to life, the necromancer, and resurrected all of his minions. And so it's set in this very Halloween-esque kind of a setting and the main character you find out actually did not kill the necromancer he was the first one to die and is kind of a coward so you're playing this cowardly skeleton who's been resurrected trying to make your way back to the necromancer and it's a early 2000s game that was remastered for the ps4 and the aesthetic is very like nightmare before christmas meets Coraline, very kind of cartoon halloween mm -hmm. And it's so damn hard. It's so damn hard. <laughs> but it's it's a ton of fun. Uh, it's kind of a collector's game remnant of Banjo-Kazooie or DK64, you know, where you're trying to collect all the golden bananas. But this time around, you're collecting Halloween-themed objects. Fun. 
it's been great fun. A lot of a lot of good fun during quarantine. And then the other funny thing that I've been doing is on Animal Crossing, um, you can actually change the welcome greeting of all of your kind of animal residents who are your friends. And I changed them to say praise Satan. So anytime I talk to any of my animal friends on my island, they open it up with praise Satan. Isn't it a beautiful day for rain? Wow. <laughs> it just makes me giggle inside. You would. <laughs> How about you? How about you, Nathaniel? What you up to? So the way I have stayed spooky recently was to watch both Suspiria films. Um, so I have a controversial opinion about them. So I really disliked the original. I thought it was very just, I don't know, it, it, it seemed like sloppy filmmaking to me personally. And I know that's going to get me, you know, hunted down and stabbed because people just adore that movie. And and this is a genuine uh, request from the community. If you love Sus- the original Suspiria, Please explain to me why you love it, because I just didn't get it. Um, but that said, I watched the uh, remake of Suspiria, and I really liked it. I thought it was really cool. Um, I felt like the witchcraft, the the dancing combined with the witchcraft was really, really dope. Um, I definitely loved the music, because Tom York is one of my favorite musicians. And, you know, anything trippy and radio heady is just my jam but yeah i just thought like the the performances were better the writing was better i don't know it's just it was much more interesting to me so i really dug the new suspiria so that is uh how i've been staying creepy and again sincerely i just want to know why people like the original one so much because it just confused me i i the whole time i was like why did why does anyone like this movie and I'm not going to fight you. I genuinely want to know. Please tell me. <laughs> or if they have different opinions than you, you'll just tell them that they're wrong. You I know, won't like, do it I, this time. I, I really want to know them. why. <laughs> <laughs> I have not seen either, and I feel like I need to now to, to see if I agree with you. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see what you would think. All right. I think that is it for our misery episode. Uh, we're going to have to do a movie that we both hate because I feel like we've just been too positive about movies lately. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of ridiculous. Well, I mean, the next one that we have on the docket is a little less uh, intense, gushy for it. So. So, yeah. Um, oh, one other thing I'm just going to say is that y'all should check out our Tee Public store again because starting to put up a bunch of new designs including one really dope one that i made uh that was uh, uh like midsummer themed one so i don't know just go go check it out see if uh you like any of our new designs maybe throw a little support our way rep your favorite podcast or you know some of your favorite horror movies so just throwing that out there and if you don't all we ask is that you stay spooky Need even more Scream Kings? Here's our obligatory shameless social media plug. Follow us on Twitter or Instagram at Scream Kings Pod. You could also email us at ScreamKingsPodcast at gmail.com. Help us reach a wider audience of horror fans by leaving a review on iTunes or by sharing a link on social media. You can also support the show by going to patreon.com forward slash Scream Kings. Stay spooky.